Hij werd een minuutje, hij nu. Het is nu ja, precies. Het is precies hier. All right. Hi and welcome to the final lecture of our series, how to become an architect. So uh, one more time, we'll be joined by young architectural and spatial practitioners who will shed a light on their paths beyond the cap and gown and will explore their transition from education to architectural practice. And today we have the privilege to present to you Mulder Zonderland. And uh, we're really excited about having them because um, we feel like we caught them in the right moment. Uh, but just before they're about to uh, like blow up in the Dutch architectural scene, if they uh, haven't already. Um, so only in 2020, Jan Maarten and Schuurt started their practice uh, between Amsterdam and Zurich. And within only three years, they've been winning some of the most prestigious, um, prestigious competitions. Uh, most notably, a really impressive design for a visitor center for the Schwarzwald in Totnau. And also for a clever redevelopment scheme for the PWA Kazerne in Gouda, together with Jan Nauta and uh, Joost Emmerich. And uh, although they may seem like the new kids on the block, they've come a long way. Um, and the lecture today has the subtitle Apprentice Autonomy, which we chose to refer to the, the post-graduation uh, training of both Schroot and Jan Maarten and practices like Sana and most notably Herzog and Moron. So taking this in mind, we hope to find out today uh, how this experience shaped their working and thinking, but also how they position themselves to carve out their own autonomous architectural practice. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to present to you Jan Maarten and Schroot. Thank you. Thanks for the for the nice words and thanks for inviting us for this uh, for this lecture. Uh, it was quite fun almost to reflect a bit on what we did the last three years and to put that in a presentation and to show to you what we went through not only from our study to the practice we worked in but also uh, how we work as an office and I think that's something we want to show. Uh, during this lecture. I think what you see here in terms of icons is a selection of projects we, we did in the last three and a half years. Uh, what you can see is that the scale varies from very small to, to, to a bit bigger, but also that there's not, very, not, not much like a style or a direction our architecture is going. It's more uh, a question of what do we get from a client, from a, from a competition, and there we search for, for the right answer. Um, I think what combines all those projects together is the, the fact of sustainability. That's a factor which is always around and which is always uh, in its appearance or in its materiality um, somewhere in, in our designs. So three and a half years ago, uh, Shoot and I started. The fact that we're here together is also something uh, not every day. Shoot is uh, living in Zurich and working, and I'm in Amsterdam. Uh, and as you can see uh, here on the map, that uh, around those two places, the projects somehow grow and uh, appear. Um, although we're, we're together uh, uh, and separate on different offices uh, of different locations, we work closely together on all the projects uh, wherever they are. This was, uh, this was very nice to make. It's uh, uh, a timetable of which projects we did. So on the underside of the, of the line, you see projects which were commissioned by clients. And on the top part, you see uh, the competitions we did in the last uh, three and a half years. Uh, and I think what you can see very well is that competitions are always around in our office and we're always trying to do them. Uh, I think uh, we do this in two manners. One is we can freely think about the question that we're asked. So you get a competition brief, a location, and you search for the right answer on a sort of uh, free thinking way. Uh, but on the other way, you can also apply to projects which is not necessarily within your reach. So they have a certain ambition or a size, uh, which as a young office is always difficult to attend. Um, and therefore, um, yeah, it's always good to do them. Especially in Holland, it's very difficult to, to, to get in those competitions because uh, you have to build a school before you can do a school. Uh, and that's different, for example, in Germany or in Switzerland where there are competitions 
which uh, there's room for uh, for young officers to attend or to to apply to get into a, a selective competition or open competition. Yeah, and then architecture is also about the things with, that's, that's not being built. So everything but fades away in this image is uh, not there anymore or uh, yeah, not being built or stopped on a certain manner. But what you can also see is that we directly when we, when we, won, when we started the, our office, the number 10 project, we won a competition and later on as well 23. And this year was an extremely good year for us by winning uh, three competitions. And in this presentation, we go through most of those projects to just show you how we did it and how we approached it. Um, another fun fact is the, the way we communicate, Shuit and I. Uh, this is a screenshot of my WhatsApp. As you can see is that we have in the last three and a half years 13 and a half thousand photos, which means uh, 10 photos a day. And that's also the way we communicate with each other. So every day, every moment, if we think about something or we see something, we share it with each other. Um, just a little bit about myself before we go into the office. Um, I uh, first did the building environment in Groningen more the technical part of, uh, of architecture. And after that, I went to uh, the TU Delft to do my master's. And doing my master's, I really embraced architecture, so to say, by doing three, three uh, semesters of various professors. I learned a lot about how they, how they were thinking and how they worked as an architect and reflected a bit on, my, on myself. Uh, just to give you an idea, 2013, when I graduated, it was a period where there was literally no work in architecture. So you could graduate and there was nothing. Uh, you could work for free or you could not work. So that was basically the thing, which was, which, which is the reason why I made my portfolio already during my graduation. So I could go abroad right away when I graduated. So I went to Japan at that time, for me, uh, a fascination and also something I wanted to experience. So after my graduation, I went to Sana and uh, Kengo Kuma. And I think this image illustrates a lot for me. So one thing is that I learned to make a lot of models and to present also in, in terms of models. And I think the stool you see over there is on the one hand the, the, the lost in translation you have in, in Japan. So the, the tiredness of the, the work ethos which is there. But also that this stool can also be a, a building. Something I wasn't used to that, that had no reason or shape or negative narrative behind it. But everything could be somehow an architectural building. Uh, so that blew my mind, especially after the period of uh, the TU Delft. Um, but after half a year, I went to, to Hetzig and Dummerol, and Hetzig and Dummerol was really the office where Schuert and I meet each other, but also inspired by Jacques and Pierre, we, we worked on projects uh, all over the world and met a lot of people who all over the world also worked in Basel. Um, I was somehow lucky to work on the Vancouver Art Gallery from scratch. Uh, this is a photo taken by the uh, public launch during the presentation of the project. But also that you work on projects which has, which has an impact and which has a, a sort of a, uh, exposure in it. So this was the next day when I was drinking a coffee where you see a person reading a newspaper with the project which you, that you just presented. So it's something much bigger as you imagine almost, and that you see then in a certain reality. I think this slide shows also how we work as an office, since we both work there. Uh, this is one project in the middle uh, on the left side is uh, where I worked on the project on the right is how it will be constructed right now. It's the fact that the project never stops. No, it's always a development of, of time. 
by influence by the architect itself, uh, the city or uh, the client, which is, a, which is a big component in it, but that it evolves and that you take your time to, to develop your, your architecture. Yeah, first photo I found, Schuert and I in the, in the cargo bar, in the toilet, where we <laughs> have our drink every Friday. Very important also besides being serious and being trying to make something beautiful is to also not talk about architecture. And the uh, other part is short. Yeah, a bit shorter about me and then we can go really into the architecture. My uh, CV is also a bit less fair out. Um, I did TU Delft uh, for almost 10 years, um, in which I was twice abroad for not really um, academic work, but I went almost a year to Sri Lanka, almost half a year to Tanzania to do build stuff, but it was not related to um, the university, which also brought a lot, I think, uh, back to me as a person, but also in our uh, work. Uh, and then what also very important is that I did um, half a year of Erasmus in Lausanne, uh, which was my first contact with Switzerland. Actually, I wanted to go to Japan as well, but uh, uh, the half year there was full, so I was appointed to Lausanne, which I didn't know at all. But the end was fantastic. Also got to know a lot of people and also really brought me into uh, Swiss architecture. Um, and afterwards I graduated TU Delft, 2012, at the end. Uh, and the same situation as Jan-Martin. Uh, there was no work. I worked there for half a year at Search, Bjarne and Masterbroek. And I earned, I think, 550 euros. Uh, and after half a year they said, uh, sure, you're doing a very good job, uh, you can stay. Uh, for the same uh, money. So then I said, uh, it's all good, but I'm going to find something else. Uh, I worked half a year in the garden of my parents, just getting a bit of money and figuring out what to do. Also really thinking about doing something else, so going into development, maybe doing something more with my hands. Um, but then also thought, maybe let's try Switzerland, which I really liked, and uh, send out, I think, around 10 applications, especially in Zurich and Basel, and the first ones to uh, React was really my joker, was uh, Herzog and Numeron, which I also didn't expect. Uh, but they said, you can come and uh, try it out with us. And that's where I worked in the end for almost uh, seven years. Started with the Roche buildings. They were already getting built, the first one. So I did the whole uh, trajectory from um, construction site up to the design of the second tower which was very interesting, was, let's say, the, less, uh, the least sexy project of Herzog and Dumeron. Nobody wanted to be on that project. Also, Jan escaped after a month, I think. Yeah. Um, but I really liked it, because I really wanted to have also this notion of how do you construct a building, how is it organized, how do you work in a team with 35 people only on the architecture side. Uh, after that, I was project lead on uh, GRID, which is also now built in Basel, and then I did uh, almost one and a half years of project management uh, on the Badaevsky Brewery with a team of again uh, 30 uh, people. And that's also where you really learn, besides architecture, how to organize the architectural part of an office, but not specific on the design part. And this also gave confidence because at one moment I got via friends of my girlfriend, I got a, yeah, the question do you want to design our house? Um, the first time they said it, I was, yeah, fine, I'm having a good job now, I like it at Hetzel uh, Gummeron. I'm not going to do it. Then the second time they asked, I reconsidered, and then I asked, told them, yeah, I, would, I will do it, but then uh, remember that I'm leaving my job, so it has to be serious. And they said, sure, we're going to make it happen, so I quit my job, started uh, under the name of Bureau Zonderland with a small assignment in Lurach, close to Basel, where I was living. And this was, uh, let's say, the first office set up in our uh, living room where we just moved. And that's all I had. I had my old iMac, I had a printer, some boards to pin uh, options on, and uh, very important, some greenery and music. And that's where the first project was. Um, I'll briefly or shortly explain it. It was a very nice uh, location on the uh, on a hilly side, so we had the view over Basel, also over the Roche Towers, over the Rhine Valley. 
uh, the client bought this uh, dilapidated house and wanted to build there yeah, a new house for him, uh, for his family, and really to live there for the rest of their lives. They come from there, they know they're going to stay there, and they just wanted to have the place uh, to grow old and their kids to grow up. Um, our actually one of the first ideas we had, maybe which also sticked, was really to from the neighborhood only see a very small part of the, of the of the dwelling and to have the rest of the living areas somehow buried into the hill and this concept stayed and also executed like this. So from the street you only see this small pathways which leads to the entrance to the garage and to the garden. Um, here you can mainly see the concept, so read the, the living uh, quarters, the guest room, uh, the garage, the office is all dug into the hill, the garden is continuing on the roof, so you also, it's a garden square meter area, you don't lose anything, and the only element which you can see is the, uh, this little small uh, dwelling on the top in timber uh, where the sleeping quarters are, and it was also executed like this, and also important features is big pergola, uh, where right now after one and a half years after execution the garden is really growing over, so you only see this horizontal uh, slither of uh, transparent facade. This is a bit to show that at the moment I was still by myself, I was also really struggling. So at one moment I was starting to make options, which we always did at HDM, but I couldn't really get further. And it also somehow led to less attractive um, architecture, I think. And it was really not because uh, I didn't want to, but I just did, couldn't get further. And that's also the moment where Jan Maarten came in. Uh, we already knew each other, we never worked together. Uh, but we did another uh, competition together, it clicked very well. He also slowly got involved in this project and then you also sense that it, for us, made a lot of sense to really work together and to have this partner which the moment he says, yes, it's nice and I agree, then you just continue. So you're not staying in this uh, yeah, swirl of uh, doubt about uh, the decisions you're taking. Um, and this was actually the moment Jan came in, they already started uh, construction, but a lot of design decisions uh, still had to be made. This also to show how we work, we really tried to make a mock-up, so a one-to-one -one, um, element of a lot of visible parts of the building, so facades, uh, windows, etc. And this was, for example, for the facade of the house uh, on top. So this is the outside of a tree, which they cut in pieces, and then they just uh, screw it to the, uh, to the under construction. This is after construction, so you see also the result. Again, this garden on top. This is the entrance to the uh, to the living or to the living room quarters, also where the main doorbell is, and then the volume uh, on top where the kids and the parents sleep. And then half a year later, how the garden slowly is growing. Um, and this is from last year. You see how the garden really is taking over. Also on the left, how the pergola is slowly getting its uh, vegetation. And uh, we're actually still waiting to photograph the building until the garden really is part of the architecture, which was from the beginning really the idea. And then it will also be uh, published. But the, all the <laughs> that's it. every time we're there, we still have the feeling that the building is not uh, finished yet. Interior, we did take pictures because the client wanted to move in and we wanted to have also some nice uh, images without uh, any furniture. So a lot of wood and back then we also chose to use a lot of uh, concrete and it's really in the details. I mean we like working on this kind of small stuff. There's a patio cut out, it's a middle image on the north side so when it's too sunny in the summer they can sit there. Uh, the bench is cast uh, together. We have these concrete tiles that are matching the walls and the interior also really always try to work some kind with a friendly uh, shapes in contrast to the, uh, to the concrete. So that was number three. Um, see on the left, as I said, we did a competition together, number five, and then at one moment, uh, Jan was still working at Kuhn van Velsen, I think? No, at Nine Dots. Yeah. Uh, and then we decided, uh, ah, we got the assignment for another project, and then we said, let's try to do it uh, together. In the end, it's super intuitive, but uh, the moment you think you want to do it, I would say just, uh, do it. Um, yeah, I think a bit later we got then same scale as the project in Lörrach, uh, project in Holland. Yeah, so this project uh, is just under Groningen in the north of the Netherlands. Uh, it was also by uh, a client 
private client. Um, they have a, had an old family, a, a family farmhouse. They are with uh, two people and four kids, so it's an amazing, busy family living there in a beautiful location uh, in the Eswald, it's called. Super green uh, and, and beautiful. Yeah, just to show you a bit how, how this procedure works. So the client came to us and asked us to make a new house for them. Uh, and this was the references they, they gave to us, that it should look something like this. Um, but we always say like, in the beginning of a design phase, we just go in, in a process with each other, we go into in a concept phase and see what comes out. Um, this, is a, this is a nice image, but we just first do the research and then see what the end result is. By researching is we, we, we found out that the existing house is actually quite beautiful in, the, in, the, in their time frame. So on the left you see uh, periods of, of construction from the 80s until the 60s, or from the 30s till the 60s, height difference, and this, this, this uh, natural roof is very beautiful and uh, has a very interesting composition uh, together with the three, two, two oak trees. So this is something we always do is we just study on a, on a broad way, like what can it be, what shape can it be and how will it, uh, how is it functioning, how is it reacting to the existing. And then we came with, out with, a, with a narrative that the, if we extend the existing house, then the the natural roof, the Rietenhoef, needs to be the main element. So the extension needs to come out of this, of this uh, natural roof and comes up so it has the same height as the, as the front house. Uh, and it positions itself in between the oak trees. Um, yeah, strangely enough, doing this presentation I thought they would like dislike it a lot or it, because it's so different than the, the references they said but it's also something you have to be confident about to, to, to go into this direction and see how far you can go and they really loved it and went for it uh, which is uh, which we, we are very happy with still um, so and how do you do it then since this is curved shape building that comes out of a, out of an existing building you first test the, 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 the trees. Well, what can the trees do? Is it, are they still healthy? Can we cut away parts of the roots uh, uh, and, and measure it? And from there we rationalized the project into four circles. So you have the green one, the orange and the blue one. And all those circles are defining the shape of the building, which is actually this. And those circles determine also how we can construct it. So we found, we did a lot of research and visited a lot of uh, contractors who, who can build this building. And what we found out by making the mock-up is that the wood construction is actually the same as a normal straight wall. The only thing you have to do is cut a round piece of the under construction and from there you can build on uh, the, the, the roof itself which they actually did. So here you can see the contractor making the curved facade by just simply measuring the circle, one of the, the, the three circles, uh, making a, a wood piece and cutting it into the, into the circle. Yeah, this is also a fascinating image, I think, showing that as an architect, I think we think it never stops by drawing it and then you just see what comes out, but it's also the fact that uh, a building starts to live as soon as it starts to build. So being there on the construction site is, uh, is a very important element of, of our office, showing how it's been built, uh, working together with the people on site and seeing how we can create it actually. Yeah, here you can see how it somehow turns out from the foundation and also the positioning in between the trees which is very close by but at the same time also very beautiful in a way the construction the position of the of the building in between the two oak trees and here you can also see the 
the beauty of the location and the, the, the views they have from their from their new from their new extension, their new living room. Just as a side note to see how, how do we how do we talk to each other now? I'm more there on site and Short is in Zurich. On the left side you see my message that it's leaking and then Short said that's not good. <laughs> And on the, on, the, on the right side you see something also, if you are so close to each other by making architecture, you communicate also the same thing. So the photo is the exact same moment showing our expression, how beautiful it is that the tree turns out to be in the window frame. Yeah, and then this research of materiality, we did a lot of searching on the right color and, and, and brick size uh, of the building and it turned out to be a brick from the, from the area in Groningen, two types of brick, clay from, from the region of Groningen and also this detail that the building is growing out of this, out of this uh, existing building and that it's constantly stepping up was a very important step to us that you have this sort of slowly growing creature almost out of this building. Yeah, and here you can see very beautiful, I think, how this new construction comes up under the Riet roof, where you have openings which are holes into the, into the facade and doors which are more closed, where, which are on top of the facade. And also this detail of slowly stepping out of this uh, out of this out of this roof here the position next to the tree and this huge open farmhouse doors this is very recent and also on the inside is the shape continues now it's a very beautifully positioned next to the tree and also sometimes you have spaces which are very narrow and sometimes they open up fully so you have this like yeah ambiance which is very natural in a way because it's so fluent in their shaping. Back to Basel where we did the house at this period and then we were very lucky that the client of the house liked us so much that they gave us another project for, uh, for a laboratory building which Schuert is gonna present. Yeah, so as Jan said, this was, um, let's say, our first big um, project. I think this is on the right now. Oh, it's number six, yeah, down there. So a direct uh, commission in Lurach again. So same uh, city as the house was uh, in an old industrial uh, area uh, where they got a piece of land. It's a brother and a sister. Both work in life science, in pharma. Uh, he has a, a logistics company in that and she has some um, apotheke. I don't know the English word, uh, and they together wanted to have one building, but two companies uh, in that, which was from the start a very important uh, starting point uh, for us. So this is the site, uh, also very nice as we um, prepared this lecture for, uh, or not a lecture, we uh, went for all the projects into Google Maps, and this was actually the first project where you can see it in uh, Google Maps, which was for us also a big uh, surprise. But here you see the, the site on the left as an old uh, textile factory, which will also now be redeveloped to um, dwellings. And on the right, it's more like schools, offices, and uh, living quarters. Uh, so this is the plot. You have, of course, the distances you need to uh, have from the site. Uh, this was mainly the program they gave. So a big part of it was logistics, more dark functions. And then there was half of it, around half of it was for uh, office always related to the logistic part. Uh, we did a lot of different studies, a lot of typologies, but in the end I uh, figured out this one uh, could work very well, also fitted the plot very well because it also opens up to the old factory. And here the idea is that the dark uh, functions logistics and the laboratories more go to the north and down in the building and the offices facing the south have their own terrace and always a direct uh, connection a visual but also physical to the uh, to the outside and this is then in detail the axonometry 
where you already see one building, but you see this element in the middle, which is the stairs, which is combining all the functions within the building, but also is the escape route from the terraces down for the fire. Um, here in section, you see this, again, central element, the stairs, which is in the inside connecting all the levels, and on the outside collecting all the terraces, and under it, yeah, it creates a very nice uh, entrance foyer for both companies, so they can go right to the one office and left to the other office. Here again explained more in diagram. Here this central element, and also here, yeah, basically with every design decision or question we have, we just try to make models, even though sometimes it feels like a waste of time or a waste of uh, energy, it always helps. We also found another thing yesterday, we were working on another competition, and the moment you do it, it takes you an hour, but you immediately think different, you see stuff different, so it worked a lot with us, and then if you see the result, then, yeah, it was for us, actually, it was never designed, because it was really a functional uh, decision, but it turned out to be a very interesting uh, space. And then again, um, yeah, as explained, the dark areas, on the north and the more light areas on the top, the office, which we are now already a step further, so they're already doing now the, uh, the interior works, um, fully glazed. Important features also the, uh, the sun shading that you can see, um, very specific architectural elements, it's not only the passive uh, sun protection for the, uh, for the sun going into the space, but at the same time there's the photovoltaic, so solar panels on the roof, so it provides the whole building uh, for the energy it needs uh, throughout the whole year. So energy-wise it can function out dark. Um, and here render from the side. And the good thing is that it will really be like this. So they started, and I don't know if we have an image of this. They started now with the PayFAO elements and uh, so this is from the side. Here again, this photovoltaic elements, green terraces, reachable from every uh, office space. Again, this is also something in Germany which is not common at all, in Switzerland it is, but in Switzerland basically for every project they do, especially the bigger one, they always build a mock-up, so a one-to-one -one element. Uh, they do a visual mock-up, something like this, so purely for how the building looks, but then they also do a technical mock-up for the contractor to figure out how elements come together which makes their whole process always also uh, way more efficient so we had to fight for this uh, with the local architect and with the client but we got it in the end uh, and it was just to figure out which color of background you want to have uh, for the aluminium panels uh, and what's the finishing of the aluminium panels so in the end there are six options um, and on the image harder to see but when you're physically there you can really determine the, the differences which was for us also a, then a good way to be happy with the decisions uh, we were taking. Um, here from the south side, again the elements I explained before, so the two offices, one building, the central stairs, and especially the green terraces and the solar panels which determine the architecture. And this was taken I think two months ago, where you already see this, yeah, also the lightness of the building appears by just adding one of these elements which is very uh, repetitive. And then interior will be a mixture of offices, but also uh, high-tech uh, laboratories. Which was for us also very good, this project, because in Switzerland there's a lot of these type of competitions happening. And to get in, you do have to have references. So we can now bring this reference, especially because it's built, it just brings us, uh, yeah, let's say, in a league which we were not in uh, before, uh, and helps a lot. Here again, construction image. Yeah, and this is just to show again that we, yeah, we tried to be there till the end and we also find a lot of joy and a lot of satisfaction in developing details uh, which turn out not only functional, because in the end you won't see this, uh, but also are uh, super functional. Then, again in Basel, so also important to note that for the house we did, uh, I immediately said to the client, I want to do it with a local architect, because it was Germany. I didn't have any experience with building on such a small scale. Uh, so he made a selection of five architects from the village. We had a talk with two of them, and then we together decided to go for one of them, uh, Moser Architecten. He also worked with us on the laboratory building, and he also then asked us to do a competition uh, in Lörrach again, where five officers were uh, invited. Um, it was our first competition, 
and also our first Let's competition with him, which we then uh, also won and really started off this, yeah, let's say, this project, not only in this village, but also in the areas uh, around. Yeah, so this was uh, in the first months of, uh, of, our, of our office, as Shuit explained. And it also shows that you sometimes have to be a bit lucky, in a way, as a young office. Uh, and yeah, we were lucky in, in the sense that we were, uh, could work on this competition, which was selected. So there were, I think, five other offices who uh, could work on this project, which was a, a church. The church had, uh, uh, it's, it's standing there, but it's lacking visitors, so they, asked to expand their church into uh, another program to make it more active and, uh, and, and visible in a way. And as we visit the site, I think it's a very important element. We felt that walking around the church, you have those areas which are very undefined in a way, as you can see here with a busy road in front, uh, a greenery around it, which was somehow not in use. Um, where in the brief was that one part of the, the, the church was, was this, which would have been dismantled. But when we were there, we directly had the feeling of putting, putting a wall around it, to have a sort of a monastery feeling around this church to, to frame it a bit better uh, and to also be a bit more specific in the, in the places around the church. So by putting a wall around it and uh, uh, with program, we we could make uh, a building actually around the church, which defines different kind of courtyard types, uh, but also keeping all the trees which were which were there. And all those trees, also you see on the underside, are cut out out of the out of the program itself. And further end, we open up the building so the people from the neighborhood could walk through the whole site and also experience those, uh, the, those courtyards and the building itself. So the ground floor itself is very simple. It's, uh, it's a square, uh, one level structure with in the middle a heart where you have a cafe and where you can meet each other. The green is where the church is. Uh, uh, and the other program are uh, offices where they help uh, people with uh, social and medical uh, mental problems. So it becomes more a structure which is in use for the area itself, but also for people who have the need for it. This was an important step in doing the competition because it's one level structure. We decided to not make uh, a parking garage, but integrating the parking within the structure and by doing that we saved a lot of cost by, by not starting to dig but at the same time since it's such a low structure the church itself stays this this main element for the for the area so it's always visible it's not we're not hiding the church but it's still uh, yeah a, a sort of anchor point in the in the whole area in the whole neighborhood. And I think this was an image from the competition. What you can also see here is that this low wooden structure in its rhythm itself has a sort of a dialogue with the church. But at the same time, in materiality, there's much more different. So the church is more mineral and the, the, the extension is all more wooden, wood-like. But the church itself stays the most important component or structure in that area. So everything we add is wood, as I already said. So also in the church, we make another wooden floor in it to accommodate the, the needs of the program. And here you can see quite nice how this cloister-like feeling around the church is, is appealing. And you have this low structure with this courtyard, which is very calm and, and, and beautiful. Um, and from here, people can go to their offices or to be, to be treated. Yeah, again, uh, I think that you can also see in all our project, we stay connected to, through the whole process until the end. I think what you see here is fantastic. This is the floor heating uh, throughout the whole building. 
but also being on site, in this case it's short, which is more there, showing or looking how this building is appearing and how it's functioning and how it's coming together and how can we shape still during the construction uh, the, the building. Here you can see this wooden table in the, in the existing church and also the new space on top where the church will be is more like a house shape now than more like a huge open um, open space. Yeah, this is a photo from uh, two, two months ago where you can see the floor and the, the, the low structure appearing, but also the courtyard in between the church and the new building uh, is, is here visible. Yeah, and being on site, checking the details, how comes everything together? I think this is also a very beautiful photo, how the details of wood connections combining the building, even until the last screw. That's also uh, an important F aspect. Yeah, and this is uh, on the left is a render and on the right it's how it is right now. Um, I think it appears quite well how we imagined it and, and sometimes even better in some points. So yeah, then we had four projects on the go in, uh, in and around, for, around Basel, in Leurach, in the same city. Um, and then we saw a competition close by in the Schwarzwald, which was an open competition. I think also something as a young architect where you can attend to. I think there were like 150 people attending to this competition. Um, so in terms of risk, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but it's good to do to actually work on this kind of projects and to have the opportunity in it. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing. It's somehow good to stay naive, especially in the beginning. So this here we had, I think, 155 officers applied for this competition. Uh, we also got in somehow lucky or lucky. We were asked by another office to participate. Uh, we need, didn't know about the competition. Uh, we really liked the program. Uh, they then stepped out. We continued, and in the end, uh, in two rounds, we uh, we won it. Uh, but again, it's also a feature from sometimes you have to go on the feeling, try it out. Or sometimes you also have to be just uh, really lucky because out of 150 officers, of course, um, to win, even if you have a good project, is uh, the chances are very low. Um, that's this one. So it was um, organized from the German um, state. Uh, the Schwarzwald became a UNESCO World Heritage Site and by being, becoming that you need a visitor center. So the competition was for a visitor center for this uh, area. And as Jan said, it was an open competition which is in Germany actually not common at all. So it was one of the first big open competitions in years, uh, which also really started the discussion again in Germany. Why don't we have this more? And I think this discussion is very relevant in Holland right now. I mean, why don't we have the chance as young officers to really uh, anonymously participate and by doing so also really having the best project to win, which in Switzerland we have a lot. So that's why you also see a lot of young officers being able to start and that's why also the quality, I would say, is so extremely um, high. Uh, so the site is in Tot now, really in the middle of the Schwarzwald. Uh, you couldn't choose it better. It's a small village slash the, the city. And in Google Maps you already feel that there's some kind of a um, scar in the middle of the city uh, where there used to be an old uh, factory it's already gone for 20 years but this scar remains um, it's also from the village itself there was this question what can we do with this um, important part of our uh, village and also here you see it it's on the left side of this tree in the middle i think we have a mark yeah that's the side on the right you see the church with the main um, city street here in google maps again you really feel this scar is part of urban tissue that was uh, once there, but now not anymore. Um, and this is the site. So we also want to show a bit uh, how we also work in this kind of process. So this is the site. This other, let's say, <laughs> you know, with the requirements, the program. So it was a visitor center slash museum. Uh, but what do you do uh, with it? Um, so what we try to do is always also find this. You know, the, you say it in German, the Geist. So the, 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 the genius loki of the, of the place, what are the elements that define 
uh, more traditional architecture? Uh, why is it built like this? Uh, is there what are the ideas behind it? Uh, and that maybe not taking this as a very banal reference, but really looking at the aspects of it, which makes it for us uh, interesting. Um, so here you come to the Schwarzwald House, very typical uh, structure in that area. And the first element is what's for us very interesting is actually the roof makes the architecture. So besides the roof, there's nothing else uh, to see. It really shapes uh, the building and defines uh, the element as it is. Second is how it deals with topology. So within this building, there's three levels, which is somehow not visible when you see it uh, just from the outside. But by analyzing it, you really feel that there's different entrances, but at the same time maintaining its, uh, its one shape. And then, of course, also the use of local material, of local craftsmanship. Uh, so again, how do we implement this then to, uh, to a site? First, starting off with the roof as architecture. Um, I went to the site by myself. I had a schnitzel there at the restaurant. And this was the tissue I got. And then we started discussing already on WhatsApp um, and sketching out. And actually, we thought, what about really taking this roof as an element as see how we can shape the, uh, the project with it. So this was also on site, again on WhatsApp, just sketching out like what happens if we have this roof that somehow with the typology also defines uh, the whole um, area from another perspective. And that's how on the first day some kind of an idea appeared. Then we also thought it would be nice to squeeze the program to the sides of the plot. So we create this very tranquil, uh, quiet in a courtyard, which could have a very different character than the, let's say, more urban character around it. Um, and then, I think Jan, you guys made this model in Amsterdam, so the first model, and in the end the building, you could say, is almost like this first uh, model. So what we try to do is take this roof, shape it also in a circle and by doing so especially for museum typology works very well because you can imagine if you have the different spaces cluttered behind each other we always end up at the same place again uh, then we could as i explained create really this uh, special space uh, outside space in the middle so the idea was really to take a piece of the schwarzwald so just let's say a kilometer away and put it there so also show the the trees, the plants, um, also as an edu educative uh, element uh, within the building. Then the building also closes off this urban tissue which used to be there. And also uh, recreates um, the village square. Because this is the Rathaus, or the, what is it in English? Burgemeester. Yeah, uh, which always was looking in this empty area. And now we create again this, um, uh, this platz in the middle. And at the same time, the same thing on the right, where there used to be <laughs> buildings, we try to close it off again, so this street uh, gets the identity that it used to uh, have. <coughs> and this then resulted in the competition model um, we did. Um, the second element is this uh, usage of how to deal with typology, because also on our plot we had the six meter difference I really felt like it should be one element. So how do you deal with, let's say, two stories of difference or one story difference within a building, which somehow also has to feel as one element, it's a bit like here now, you do go up, but you still, yeah, it's not a, it's not a tough uh, walk to get there. So the section shows this, so we really tried to have the spaces, and we like, let's say we dropped the roof on the topology and it created the spaces uh, by itself. Here you see the six meter differences with the exhibition hall in the middle. Um, and then in the courtyard, you also create this moment where you can really look over the building uh, to the surrounding uh, mountains. So here again, this difference of, uh, of height. And then the, uh, the forest garden in the middle. Yeah, and here's a small walk around also to show, let's say, the qualities or the differentiation of this building from every, uh, yeah, from every corner where it really gets a different identity from different perspectives you look at. <coughs> then shortly about the architecture, I mean, for the other lecture, we really explained the whole building, but it's a bit too short for now. It's just the main entrance is on the, let's say, on the, uh, on the city square uh, 
area. This is an image we made for the competition. So again, one roof, which really defines the architecture. And we already discussed that we would love, when the project starts, to even draw this roof further down. So you maybe in the end only have two meters where you can really walk under, or maybe even lower at some places. So there's nothing else left but, uh, but the roof. And this is then a view from the restaurant uh, on this six meter higher level where you can look over the um, surrounding areas and also have this contact, this reference point in the middle with the forest garden. Uh, briefly about the materialization, everything we try to do in timber and um, clay, so rent uh, clay. And this is also something that uh, the locals there are able to work with uh, and also have the confidence to do so. So that strengthens us also in proposing this for the competition and was very much appreciated by the, by the jury. Um, this is a AXO from another project in Zwolle, but in the end, same type of materials, so natural bio-based uh, materials as far as we can take it, with wood, earth, cork, flux, uh, etc. This is not a building from us, but it shows also a bit the materialization, and we also use this in the competition just also to give the jury a bit of an idea which direction we wanted to go. And here the same. Yeah, yeah so just to sum up, this was uh, the first one and a half years of our office. Um, a lot of stuff happening, you know? <coughs> a lot of stuff construction going on. At the same time, uh, you win a project and you are super happy and uh, up to constructing it. But then if you go into 2002, the project Schuert presented in Tottenau didn't start yet. So the competition was somehow passed and the project is on pause. We worked a lot on the running project, like the church and the laboratory building. But at the same time, we also forgot a bit to, to search further and to, to, uh, to do more, uh, yeah, look for other uh, projects or to, to widen our portfolio a bit. So up until uh, the beginning of this year, where there was, let's say, a big pass of uh, project flow, of cash flow, and uh, a very critical moment uh, of our office, so to say, and it's also something, I think, if you start your own office, there is also a certain reality in it sometimes. Um, I think this image shows very good and honest what it is. So on the right side, you see our, um, our bank account back then, which was uh, not much. And on the right side, you see uh, a project with a list of names like Goldhauser, E2H, uh, Hetzkendum, Holbuder, where we were selected as a young office to do a competition for. So there was this duality almost between no money, but a lot of chances, a lot of people who like us, and a very nice Instagram, but at the same time, uh, it's also painful in a way. Yeah, maybe I can... I think it's really important because looks now like only a screenshot but really last year for example we didn't pay ourselves out so we had to live on the money of our girlfriends and you can imagine it's uh, it's not easy and especially this last let's say the end of 2022 we really had to make this decision what are we going to do so we were also applying for other jobs actually the same idea i had before i went to uh, basel so what do you want to do if it doesn't work out um, and then we did actually also for this competition here we first had to do a vision so we didn't know that we got in uh, at the same time, Zwolle also popped up as a competition, but also there we said we want to participate, but we didn't know the outcome. But we did make this choice, okay, we don't have any money, we're going to try it now for half a year. Uh, we're going to live on nothing, but we're just going to work. Uh, and it luckily also paid out, so we won both competitions. Um, but it's also good to realize that it's not always, as Jan said, this Instagram image of fantastic, we win everything, it goes well, but there's also moments where you're just yeah, really struggling and also going home and uh, what, 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 what are we doing? <laughs> um, yeah. But at the same time we were uh, very lucky uh, by winning both of the projects. So on the, on the 
left side you see a project which is, isn't published yet. It's uh, a project in Zurich which we are working on right now, uh, which we won. Uh, and the other one is uh, Zwolle, maybe, maybe you have seen it, but this is together with uh, Joost Emmerink and uh, Jan Nata, uh, which is uh, a bio-based uh, living uh, building block. Uh, yeah, and it gave us also opportunities for other projects right now, so we really feel that we are growing again by just winning those, uh, those, two, those two projects. Um, I don't know how we do with time, but I think it's also nice if we guys can have some questions about it, uh, about what we do. Or yeah, uh, so we could go in depth into these two projects, but we thought it's also maybe nice to just stop now and just have this five or ten minutes. I don't know how long you guys have to just uh, answer some questions. Uh, I was wondering, like, <coughs> you were telling us that you have done different competitions. Um, is the competition all, always these 150 people, or what is that normally? Like? Well, in Germany, we've been we've been trying or looking. Uh, Germany is normally always based on references, so they choose normally up between 15 and 20 offices based on references. So if it's an office, you need to show you did an office. It's a bit like in Holland, but always a lot of people. So never, yeah, less than 15. Only for the. Can you hear me like this, or should I? Ah, okay. Um, ah. For example, the church was invited once, so just a client which doesn't, uh, he, he doesn't have the obligation to do a competition, but he just wanted to have, let's say, quality and therefore invited five offices. Uh, but the competitions normally are, let's say, between 15 and 20. Switzerland is differently, it's super well organized, and every public building has to be a competition. Also, a lot of private uh, clients also do it because they just realize you invest a bit, but you get a lot back. And there it varies. I would say 50-50, half of them are open, so everybody can join. It's anonymous, so also even you guys, while studying here, could join. Um, it's just that if you, let's say you win it, you have to be an architect, um, but it can also be from abroad, so most people don't realize this, but there's a lot of, uh, from schools to office buildings, to pharma, to even museums, where there's a lot of open competitions which are anonymous, so nobody knows who is handing in the project, and the best project wins. And then you have a lot, a large part of the competitions which are selective, so they do select based on your portfolio. Uh, but there normally it's let's say between five and ten offices. But then they give the opportunity to one, two, or three young offices, which have to have less requirements. So if they ask for let's say the normal offices to have two build projects, they ask for the young offices to have two competition projects. And then based on that, there's always this 20% of young offices which participate and which also normally have a high uh, chance of winning because they put so much more effort into this. So this competition on the left, yeah, for us it was incredible. We were there with our, uh, like, working against our old bosses um, and uh, with other offices which we never thought we could even uh, be working with or uh, against. And then we got the project. So for us it's still crazy. I mean, we're doing all these workshops in Zurich where you're sitting, let's say, to your, yeah, to the, to the, women and men which you never thought you would be sitting in the same space with and uh, it's all because of this anonymous uh, competition scheme which they have there. Yeah. So I think we also have the feeling, I mean we just started, but we'd love also to somehow see how via different ways to see if in Holland this is also possible and how can you achieve this and which, yeah, how, how, how because it's, it's good for everybody. It's not only good for the architects but also for the clients um, and this, this major development uh, uh, world which is now here in Holland now. I mean every project is basically there's always a developer in between. Um, it's already fucking up the, the, the whole process and also the quality of the of the of the projects. Yeah. Um, I was wondering when you're in a period of uncertainty and you're doing a lot of competitions that you try to win. And for instance, now you, you notice that you win two pretty big projects in one go, basically. How do you manage the time that you have, basically, in a week or in a month or in a year, not knowing how much work you're having or getting, or, or too much work you're getting? Or in a it, yeah, in our experience, um, you always can plan a bit ahead. So. Um, 
if a project starts, you can say, okay, we need an, an extra month to somehow structure it. But most of the time, it just takes a lot of time before a project started. And also when you w win the visitor center, it doesn't start at all. So in that sense, you can also... Yeah, you're really busy with, uh, let's say, let's send out applications and uh, let's get some more computers. And then two, three months later, you didn't hear anything. And now we're almost two years further and we still didn't hear anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it will happen. It has to happen, but it's just oh, then also a money thing. But uh, we learn this now. If we win a competition, it's fantastic. We pop the champagne, but then we also know, you know, let's take a breath and uh, yeah, see what will be the, the real outcome. Yeah. But, but you're right, it's possible that there will be a, a tsunami of work coming, but at the same time it can also not be like that. And if it comes, then you can also discuss it. Yeah. But then it's really a matter of just very dry yeah, getting people in and maybe getting them in on a more flexible base. So also to say, let's, yeah, maybe within half a year or a year, we won't have enough work. And that's also how you then put the contracts uh, together. But all architects understand this. Yeah. But for us, it's also searching. As Jan said, we were with seven or eight. We were at one moment with three. And you learn also how you, uh, how you work with this uh, fluctuation of, uh, of people. Yeah. Do you think you would have managed without your experience in building up? No, I got it. If we would have managed without the experience in the big offices. Um, yeah, for me it was a crucial moment to experience how uh, how you work there and uh, um, yeah, see what the possibility to get a bit more confident in in the way you are as an architect. This for me personally, I think for sure as well, um, it was somehow essential. I think, but I think there is also possibilities that you just start right away after your graduation, and that's also a path you can go. But uh, for me, I think it was, yeah, it was very important to, to meet also the people and to understand how you, how you proceed uh, architecture or yeah, projects. Yeah, I think it has, it, it has a lot to do with, uh, with confidence, as Jan said. Because when I graduated, I didn't know anything about architecture. Whatsoever. I didn't even want to be an architect. And then uh, you have this, especially Hedrick Dumeron, was this, you know, this people that you think they're... Um, this, uh, what is it? Myth almost. Yeah, this myth with do everything perfect and every, every choice they make is right, but then you, you are there and then they're the same people as us who are struggling, uh, who, does, who don't know exactly which way to go, who make two million options. Um, so then you also realize, you know, it's just a normal process. So this confidence you gain by seeing even the, the let's say the best architects struggling, but in the end do uh, coming to a nice, uh, result yeah you, you get this confidence of ah, if they can somehow do it maybe we can also uh, do it but also as Jan said I could also definitely imagine you do a competition in Switzerland as a first year architect you win it it's happening a lot and you just start because then you have to start and then you just learn by uh, by making mistakes and even after the seven years at HDM I didn't know how to make a building so this house in Lura was for me the first time I was actually doing a project because you're such a small part of the big machine um, that you're learning a lot on a certain level but in the end you're learning nothing about the rest and by doing your own thing you have to do everything so it's not only architecture but also finances it's uh, cleaning the floor making sure there's cheese in the fridge I mean it's maybe a joke but you do in the end you really realize uh, yeah, what architecture is about so I I think if you're confident enough to do something right now already or just after studies just 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 try it and uh, you will fall down a few times, but that's how you, uh, that's how you learn. Since uh, it seems that you <coughs> made a lot of competition, uh, especially from the start, what do you think is your uh, right process to approach one of these competitions, be it public or private? What are you going through when you decide to have this type of competition? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, I think um, we always we always search for competitions on the, on the website, and then we look at the program. Um, we look on the location, but I think an important factor is also who's in the jury. So who, this we learned. We did who, another competition with 170 uh, architecture office just because we liked the program. 
that uh, if somebody doesn't understand what you're doing as a jury, then it doesn't make sense. It's in general, 170 we would never do again. I think above 20 or 30 we would never do again. But even then with the 20, yeah, the jury is super important. Yeah, so this, you have to have a certain uh, quality in it and a certain uh, direction which you, which they understand you or you think they would understand you in a way. But I would just advise you to also do a competition with 150 people. You should just do, you should just start. You should just uh, experience it, experience the, the feeling of doing a competition, uh, experiencing the loss of doing a competition, that all your work is gone, but at the same time, you also learned a lot. So by doing all those competitions, we also not even learned from each other, but also learned of uh, how to make uh, a specific building or a competition or how to approach it. Yeah, so basically we don't, uh, we don't look at size at all. It can be a small extension, it could be a massive master plan. If we find the assignment interesting, we think the jury is good. Um, location was important, but we also realize now the more beautiful the location, the more people are participating. It really makes a difference. So let's say the least attractive competitions are the ones where there's also the least people uh, attending, uh, but then also normally it's also less uh, quality in jury. So it's, yeah, you have to weigh it uh, out. But you definitely learn from every mistake, especially you make, uh, what to do. Because we've been putting months of works in something and we already felt that it's, it's just not it. And then you don't even get in the top 10 and then yeah, you're throwing away yeah. the work. And I, th and I think what's important, um, for example, in the church, we were collabing with the Moser architects. Uh, and in Zwolle, it was with Jan Nauta and Joost Emmerink. So the sort of learning from people who are more experienced in a way is also uh, very important to bring you further as a young, as a young firm because you, yeah, you don't have the references, the correct references or uh, the, the right knowledge, so to say. So that can also bring you a lot further. And for example, with Jan Nauta, it was just uh, DMing with each other. And then at a certain moment, we saw this competition and we said, uh, Shall we drink a coffee and see if we have a match in this competition? Yeah, that turned out to be uh, fantastic. Okay. Oh yeah. You want to continue with slides? You need to go to a class. You don't... Yeah, it's just two slides, but I think it's fine. It's, uh, yeah. We'll do it yeah. in, uh, in five years again. Yeah. <laughs> years again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good luck, everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>